Welcome to the Rise to the Challenge podcast. Joining today, he's a singer, songwriter, performer, and author. It's John Michael Ferrari. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing very well, Alex. Thank you for having me on your show. We're so excited to have you on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. What we like to do with Ooh. all of our guests is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what did you like to do growing up? Well, I actually grew up uh, in San Francisco, uh, Bay Area, Nevada, Carson City. Went to Carson City High School, went to Las Vegas High School, and they encouraged me to drop out of school and join the military, and I did. <laughs> Was that always something that you wanted to do or was that kind of like pressured for you? Well, they made a suggestion. I mean, you know, I was getting nothing but A's in, 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 in a school. And every time I walked in the classroom, the teacher would go, hey, you know, so that was an indication that I should be out of school. They encouraged me to leave school and join the military. And it was a good thing. It was a good thing. I was uh, 17, going to be 18. I turned 18 in my senior year, and I joined the Army. And that was a wonderful thing. And and I got to do a little singing in the Army because I started playing guitar when I was very young. I think I got my first guitar when I was eight years old. And um, when I got out of the Army, I went back into performing little clubs and making a living doing that, surprisingly. Uh, and back then, making $30, $40 a night was a lot of money. <laughs> but here's the thing that's different. Like when I started out, uh, you every almost every club had entertainment. Mm -hmm. So you could make a living. You know, my rent was like uh, $125 you know, a, a month. And if you're making $30, $40 a night, I mean, that's, that's really good. So a, a young artist could really own his craft because you would perform every night and then mm -hmm. you work at a certain club here for six weeks and then you go to somebody else for six weeks and, and you'd make the rounds and you'd work year round and make a living they don't have that anymore and that's why uh you older entertainers they learn their craft and younger entertainers don't have a place to do that now they do that in nashville they have a club where you can sing see them they don't get paid you know it's different uh, when I grew up, they paid you. Every club paid you. <laughs> when you got the guitar for the first time, what did you enjoy about playing the guitar growing up? Well, I, I first of all, I didn't know how to hold the guitar. So which way do I hold it? And I thought, let me go look at a picture of Elvis, because however Elvis is holding the guitar, <laughs> that's how I'm going to hold the guitar. So I figured out, because I'm left-handed, but I hold it right-handed. So I learned mm -hmm. how to play that way. So that was fine. Uh, if I would have saw a picture of Paul McCartney, I guess I would have <laughs> <laughs> been playing the other way. But were, um, yeah. Were Elvis and Paul McCarthy kind of like your music idols growing up? Well, I think Elvis was everybody's. I mean, my gosh, I remember as a kid, Elvis coming to town to San Francisco. It was a big deal, even back then. I mean, it was just uh, amazing how electrifying just his name was when we were all kids. It, mm -hmm. was, it was an amazing thing. I don't know if you, we have anybody like that. We have well-known artists and then we had it with the Beatles, but who today I mean, creates that kind of excitement? You know, maybe Taylor Swift. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Ed well, Sheeran. You know? Yeah, well, definitely Elvis had a persona that everyone just enjoyed. Like you see him go on stage and even now when they're doing movies about him or replicating and kind of doing inspiring things, it's just that energy that people enjoy. Tremendous energy. You know, we were watching the movie Elvis the other night and people don't realize uh, he had to do two shows a night in mm -hmm. Vegas. That in itself is a tremendous amount to have that kind of energy. And not only Elvis, all the uh, main showroom artists, uh, stars, were doing two shows. You had a, a, a eight o'clock show and a midnight show. And each one was an hour and a half, but sometimes they go two hours. And to put out that kind of energy mm -hmm. every night, and they play seven days a week many times for uh, six or eight weeks. I mean, that wears you down. I mean, it just... You can see, understand why, you know, people get hooked on uh, certain uh, uh, drugs, you know, to keep themselves going. But it's important, I think, for artists today to stay healthy and 
and stay strong to be able to keep up that that momentum when you do a show. If your path didn't lead you to the army when you turned 17, 18, do you feel music would have been that industry you would have gone right into? Or do you feel that a different path may have happened? I was always interested in music. You know, it was something I always wanted to do. And I think you're either born with it uh, or you're not. Some people are just born with that interest. There's something that's Mm -hmm. compelling that moves you in that direction. Doesn't mean you'll be successful but there's something in that direction. When I was in the military, I liked the military. Uh, and it, it, uh, it was good for me because it taught me discipline, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and a lot of other things, leadership, you learn leadership qualities. And when I got out, you know, uh, I went back to music and it was a good thing that I had. I was not encouraged much by anybody I would tell people I want to be a, you know, a singer, a guitar player. And nobody really encouraged me. They always said, well, you can't make a living doing that. And they were wrong because you can. If you have the right support, even if you don't, you can make a living. And at that time, I think it's difficult now because in L.A., New York, and places like that, maybe some jazz clubs they paid. But most of the time, they don't pay the artist. And it's mm-hmm. really a shame because how are you how are you going to go out there and, and, and learn your craft? Because if they're paying you, you can sustain yourself night after night and and uh, get better. You know, and that's unfortunately we don't have that today. How long did you end up serving in the military? Two years, two years. But I always thought I should have stayed in longer. You know, I think I don't have many regrets in life, but I think I should have stayed in longer. Just maybe another two or three years. You know. It would have been good for me because I got out and I was young. And here's the thing I tell young people, find a mentor, a mm-hmm. mentor that they can help you along because I didn't have one. I didn't have a, a father. I had a stepfather, which we were not very close and we didn't get along, but I didn't have a father and I didn't have a mentor. So I made a lot of mistakes. And when you're young, I think I guess you're entitled to make mistakes. You're supposed to, but be nice. We didn't have to make all those mistakes. But if I would have had somebody to guide me, I think uh, I would have been. It would have helped me a lot, you know. So I tell young people: find somebody you admire and and be with that person, work with that person, and listen to what their advice is. Because you know, when you get older, you've made a lot of mistakes, and you can help somebody else from making the same mistakes they're going to make their own mistakes and i think making mistakes is good you know, mm-hmm. because you you learn from it hopefully so it's part of growing you know making the mistakes but you still it's nice to have a mentor starting out in your music career what was your style of music when you were performing i liked i liked all kinds of music you know uh, uh, growing up uh i of course I don't know if anybody remembers Al Jolson, but I saw a movie called The Al Jolson Story. And he was a singer back in the early 1900s. He was the Elvis of that time. Mm-hmm. And um, he'd come out and he'd sing and entertain people and dance. And I saw the the movie, The Al Jolson Story, and I thought it was just fascinating. I, I liked his style of music. Um, of course, they don't sing that today, but... Uh, and then I started watching TV and there were other people like Danny Kay, and he was a singer dancer and I'd love the way he moved and, you know, uh, and I, I liked those kind of uh, stars that, that they could sing and dance. So I was influenced by a lot of people like that. And then in the sixties, um, I think we had the greatest music back then, sixties and seventies, they're memorable. There were great songs today. They're still playing them today. And if you listen to my music, you will hear a combination of the 60s, 70s, and a little bit of the 80s mixed in with today's sound. And and uh, I, I kind of mix it that way. you know. So they say my mu- music's unique. It's just a, a mixture. You know, many people, young people today, they listen to one or two artists and they mimic what they're doing. They try to be like them. 
well, I've had years and years of, of influences of different people. So I kind of mix it all together. So it's hard for people to say, well, what does he do? He, you know, he writes show tunes and he writes country songs and he writes rock and roll. I mean, I'm all over the place. It's because I have that experience and been exposed to different genres of music. And, and uh, so I can write that way. So it's uh, really been a benefit to, for me. I think that's what's great about artists is if they're able to kind of go into different genres, it's not stuck into one because you see the creativity in that artist and what they're able to create, the lyrics, the style, music, right. all in those different genres. And I like how you said that because you're not focused on a niche market in a way. You might find someone that loves you for your country, but they find interest in your rock songs or your show tunes and right. they become even more of a fan. Yeah, and and you know, in writing songs, you know, I, I always tell people listen to different styles of music. I mean, that's how, you know, everything from jazz to pop to uh, old standards, and see if you can grab something and, and mix it into your music. Uh, that's what I do. You know? When you're writing songs, where's the inspiration coming from in the lyrics? Is it from personal events, things that are going on? Where is that coming from? You know, when you're inspired by an incident or somebody in your life, it helps open that creative door. Mm -hmm. If you're not inspired by anything, it's hard to sit down and just write something. You can, and it, it, it can be all right, you know, but we all want to write something that's better than what's all right. Mm -hmm. So when I meet people or people come to my life or something happens to me, um, I, it's something that it encourages that creativity in me so that I can, gives me an extra energy and I can sit down and write things. And I seem to click in and most songwriters will tell you, there's a certain something out there that you can just click into that speaks to you and gives you lyrics and things. And, and Pepper, my music producer, she, you know, is like, where does that come from? I said, I know. I said, like, it's beyond me beyond my capability, you know, most of the time, but I just feel like God speaks to me in such a way I hear what he's saying and, and, and like he gives me words and lyrics and, and um, things I couldn't have come up with myself, but things I could not have come up with if I wasn't inspired by somebody or something. I think we need that. We need to have that in inspiration of someone or something. You know, that's why I write love songs. You know, people say, well, you write." I had somebody in uh, Nashville after a session. They said, oh, you, all your songs are so happy. You know, it's like he had an incredulous look on his face. Like, why are all your songs happy? You know, I like to write happy love songs. That's what I'd like to do. <laughs> in the earlier times when you're creating songs, is there one song that if someone has never heard of you before, that they should go listen to that one to really understand who John Michael is? Well, I have songs from my early years when I wrote differently, but they're, they're story songs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're different than what the songs I have today. It'd be hard, you know, because, you know, it, it's not like, you know, there was a performer uh, called Sammy Davis Jr. You, have you ever heard of him? You see him on TV. You know, I think, oh, he's all right. He's pretty good. But it's not until you see him in person, the whole picture. It's hard to take this one thing that defines you. So it's hard to say, well, listen to this one song because it defines me. Yep. You have to sit down and listen to the, what, all of them. I mean, you have to find out like, oh my gosh. He, I mean, he's all across the board and, he, and he's doing things that, that resembles show tunes and, and opera and country. So it's not just one, because if you take just one song, it doesn't adequately represent who I am. You know, like um, Love When Love Say Goodbye. It's an old kind of 50s style song. Um, and then Bubblegum songs. Uh, uh, how can, what's the one, that, uh, Heart? Uh, my Heart Can't Breathe. Now that's a pop song. That, that, that mm -hmm. got a lot of radio play. Um, and a different song, uh, uh, masquerading in the night. They got a completely different radio play. And here's an interesting thing. It's like, I tell writers, know your goal. 
as a writer, you have to know your goal. What is your goal? Is it to get on radio, radio format? Or is it just for your friends? Or is it for the band you're playing with? Because if you don't have a particular goal, a specific goal in mind, you're going to miss the mark. When mm -hmm. we went to the studio, we knew we were going to write radio uh, format songs. There's a, a specialty in, in doing that. Uh, you know, your intro, your verse, pre-chorus, chorus, back again, bridge, and you're out. And, you, and your title has to be a certain place. You can map it out. You know, many popular songs are that way. Our goal was to get on the radio. From the time we recorded the song and the radio promoter pitched the song, within two months, we had our first song on the charts. Wow. And then if, and then after that, all almost every song that was on that first album was on the charts. That's because we had a goal. We, we knew specifically, you know, what we wanted and how the format was going to be. Now, one of the songs, uh, the session leader in uh, Nashville said, well, this is way out of the of, of radio format. You'll never get radio play. And I said, that's true, but it's not for the radio. It's for the listener who buys the CD, something extra, something different, you know. So as a writer, I, I, I tell people, know your goal. Because I hear writers write songs that good songs, but they're not in the radio format, and they'll never get on the radio format, no matter how good. There's an algorithm that tracks your songs and promotes your songs, especially on Spotify and all those places like that. If it's radio format, you'll get pushed in a certain area. If it's not, you're going to get pushed in a different area. So it's very important for our songwriters to understand that. You talked about goals and writing for a specific goal, especially nowadays where a lot of people it's online with Spotify, Apple Music or iTunes and things like that. What goes into your mind to get that goal, but on those platforms, because not many people are buying albums, but they are still out there, but everyone wants that quick, easy access. Well, different, you know, there was a time when people would just go into a record store and buy a 45, mm -hmm. it's like a dollar 19, or you can buy an album, which is four or $5. That money went straight to the artist and to the publisher. So if you sold a million copies, you got a nice paycheck. Yep. Today, it's not like that. You have to have, you know, 10 million streams, you know, to get 40 bucks. Wow. You know, you, you just don't, I think you get one ninth or one, Tenth, ninth of a cent. Ninth of a cent. Wow. For every stream, you know, there's no way that a writer can make a living anymore. The whole industry's changed, but somebody's making the money. Mm -hmm. It's not the writer anymore, uh, and it's a shame because, you know, back then when you bought the 45, you actually owned your own 45. That was yours. You know that your own copy. And you couldn't duplicate it because look what I got. You know, mm -hmm. you want yours, you have to go buy yours. Today, you know, you can download every song on, from Pandora and everything. You're not buying anything. You're just bu buying a, a subscription that's ten dollars a month, and you can listen to every song in the world. Yep. You know, now the only thing, like when we perform live, we do get paid royalties from our live performances. I don't know if a lot of artists know that. But when we perform, Pepper makes out, uh, um, sends in to ASCAP what songs we performed in our concert, and we get a little bit of money from that. So artists should know that when you're performing your own songs, if you belong to ASCAP or BMI, you should notify them that you pl uh, played these songs in your performance, and you'll get a royalty check because the venues pay uh, uh, a fee so that they can have an entertainment license. Mm -hmm. That entertainment license pays ASCAP. And if you put your name in, then you get a little little check. If you don't, they just keep the money. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of live performances, do you have a memorable performance that you've done in your career? Well, you know, memorable is the times when you make mistakes, you know, like, oh, see, I'll never do that again. <laughs> but, you know, um, you know, I have a saying that there's never a stranger in the audience. And when I, I used to come out, and, and I still do it today, when I open up a show, like in a new town or city, I'll come out with all the enthusiasm, and I, and I look at the people, and I point to them, and I, it's like, 
people, they ask me, well, how do you know all these people? Because you act like you know them all. So I mm -hmm. don't know them. But if you go out there with the uh, perception of there's never a stranger in the audience, they're all your friends, you know, you move an audience. And I look, always look forward to that. So it's hard to pick out one particular night or, you know, sometimes you just have a great night. You yeah. know, where it's like everything you do, everything you say, people laugh and it's funny. And then the other nights, it's like, it's not working. Those are nights you got to work because, you know, sometimes you come out and, and you can do the same show, same song, but it's just not working. And when I'm working with the band, sometimes I, I change the routine right in the middle. Like we're going to some, do different songs, right? And they go, well, what are we doing? You know, just follow me. You know, many times they go, what's our opening song? And I changed it. You know, like, <laughs> what is it? I said, I don't know, but you'll know when I call it out, you know? And so I just do it off the cuff. You know, you got to keep it fresh. You know, I, guys like the, the they want a song list. So if you're in a band, they, they want a song list. I try to make a song list, but sometimes I don't always keep to it. I'll throw in something else or, you know. But uh, each night is memorable, you know, and I don't always remember everybody that come to the show, but I'm always thankful that they're there and they took time out of their life to come in and spend it with me and, and, and uh, my band members, you know, it's always appreciative. For people that are listening to the audio version of this, they're not going to see your amazing background that you have behind you. Oh, yeah. Is that something that you like to be creative about? Did you come up with that concept or was it a team effort? Like, I think you talked about performance and the creativity in you. I get that from just seeing the background behind you. That's our stage. Uh, and we have, uh, this is where we rehearse our shows. You know, there's a difference between just rehearsing and going through the motions. Mm -hmm. I tell people, you know, sometimes I work with people and other singers, and I go, well, let's do it like it's a real show. They go, no, I, I, wait, I save all, all my energy for the show. I said, no, we have to do it. Like, there's nobody here. This is our stage. This is where we rehearse. We have to do it like it's a real show. You have to get that energy up. Know what it feels like. When you're doing the show, what your movements are going to be, uh, what you're going to say, practice what you're going to say. So when you get out there, it's so easy, mm -hmm. you know, because if you wait to get out on the show and then give it all you got, you're going to mess up. But if you get it all you got when you're rehearsing, you're going to feel really confident. You know, when we have a show coming up and I, and I have people coming here, I have one of my singers sitting on the side. You know, she, uh, we go through the show over and over again. You know, let's go through it again. Let's go through it again. You know, like we were performing it, you know. Um, and it makes a difference. So when you rehearse, you really got to do it like you're doing a show, not just like you're rehearsing and let's just go through the song. You know, I heard uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was talking about working out with weights. And he goes, I see people, you know, just lifting weights going like this, like this. He says, you kind of, when you lift the weight, you have to imagine the muscle working, yep. working and building, you know, feel it. Then you get results. That's the same thing when you perform and you rehearse, do it as though you're going to do it in the real show. Say those lines, say the, what you're going to do, make that move, do everything. So when you get out there, it comes automatic. You don't have to think about it over and over again, repetition over and over again. You know, I can't tell you how many times we rehearse uh, uh, for a show. It's like a, a Broadway show. Look at what they go through. I mean, yep. they're sweating and they're ready to fall on the floor. They go over it so many times. Go, let's do it again. Back for one. Back to one. Do it again. Do it. That it's work. It's not just rehearsing once a week. We rehearse every day. My singer and I, we come in here, and if there's other people in the show, we rehearse every day, every day. I love that you mentioned that because that same concept works in so many industries. Even like if you're a trainer in a business, you're practicing yes. your or your performance or your speech or something in motivational speakers. They're doing the same thing. They're practicing like if they're on a stage because they want it to feel natural coming to them on stage. And I liked how you mentioned, even if there's zero people, make it feel like there's so many people there to get that practice in. I do, and I'll come in here and throw in all the lights, set it up. If it's just me, I may mm -hmm. come in here just by myself, and I'll go through the show. 
And yep. sometimes if I know that, that like, uh, uh, I know we're going on at eight o'clock or going on at six o'clock, that's when I start my rehearsal. I start my show at that time. So I really feel the energy of what I'm doing. You know, we got an eight o'clock show. We're going to do a bunch of eight o'clock shows. I know I start at eight o'clock, do the show. So I know where I'm at at every moment, the 10 after, 20 after, you know, not that I'm watching the clock, but <laughs> I know where I'm going to be at that moment, you know. And that's what doing a Broadway show is, you know, every night you start the show at, at eight o'clock, you know, <laughs> you know, you got to get into that rhythm. It takes a lot of work, but you know what? There's a difference between being good yeah. and being excellent. It's just that little bit of better, you know, and then you're at excellent and then becoming outstanding. The everything below that, it doesn't get you good results. It gets you okay results. Good gets you okay results. You know, being better than that gets you okay. But when you're outstanding and people see you, they know it when they see it. They go, wow, this is worth the money that I'm paying to see the show. And uh, can I bring my, uh, uh, little, uh, this is my, uh, uh, we, we work together all the time. This is Sophie Love. She's back here. Yay. Hello. Hi. And she, we rehearse, don't we rehearse all the time? Yes, we do. We do, uh, you know. Uh, and Sophie plays drums, she plays bass, she plays guitar, and we do different things. But when we do our shows, primarily, she does the, all the backup singing, the terrific backup singing. And what's that? And some of the leads, yeah. So we go through the show. I remember when we first started off, she used to get nervous. But we went through the show so many times. It's like when you, when we get up there and do the show, it's like, that's like rehearsing. It's like what we yep. do in rehearsal. You know, anything you want to ask Sophie? <laughs> Would you, John talked about earlier about he wished he had a mentor. Do you feel that John is a mentor to you? And that's how you guys been able to share the passion in music. I feel very much that he is my mentor. And it's definitely very great that we get along so well. It makes it very enjoyable in working together. We do. We get. We laugh so much. When we, <laughs> we, we, I mean, because we put a lot of hours. Yeah. In, in rehearsing, two, three, four hours, and and we have fun. You know, we we work hard, but we have fun. We laugh, and I, I think that's really, you know, really great for me because to work with somebody that just oh she's taken off now. <laughs> <laughs> um, that you enjoy, and and we try to work with everybody in the band. That yeah. you know that way with. We get along with everybody. Uh, we don't bring politics into our music. You know, uh, whatever your, you know, political favor is, we don't we don't bring it here. We don't talk about it. You know, when you walk through the door, whatever problems you have in in the world out there, we don't bring them here. You know, sometimes you know you can see somebody's a little down, but we get them laughing, get them singing, get them rehearsing. They forget about it. You know that that's. We would try to create that, you know. So what does the future look like for you? What are you hoping to accomplish in the next few years, both personally and professionally? Well, you know, I I surprised at this juncture of my career of the, the success that has happened. Um, you know, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I wanted what I have today. I thought I want to be one of those guys, you know, that become famous and playing clubs and, and mm -hmm. making recordings and having my songs on the radio. Um, it was just the other day, Pepper and I were driving down the uh, uh, road and I turned the radio on and I thought, that sounds familiar. And she goes, that's your song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I knew it sounded familiar. I said, okay. I mean, but th that's a nice thing, you know, is to hear that. And it didn't happen when I was young. It happened when I, when I was much older. And and surprised because I'm in a genre of music. I'm in a pop crossover, uh, country. I'm in I'm in how many genres of music? Gospel. And this is because we had a goal, you know, uh, of what kind of uh, format music we were going to do. And many of the songs have been crossover. They were on the country charts, they were on the uh, adult contemporary and the pop charts, all at the same time. 
you know, and it didn't happen just once. It happened several times mm-hmm. and it's contributed to, to knowing your goal. And, uh, and I tell you, working in Nashville with the studios that we work at and the musicians, oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh. I, and, and the session leader, I mean, it's like a whole different world and Pepper takes in there and she's, you know, uh, running everything, it takes the pressure off the artist. You know, mm-hmm. we do all our preparation before we get in there and we have charts made up and we kind of know what we're going to do. But we give room for the uh, musicians to do what they're going to do. And it just brings it to a higher level. We have our own studio and people hear my what I do in the studio and they go, well, that sounds like radio quality. I said, believe me, it's not. It's not radio production by any means. And I'm not going to try to, you know, do it myself. We go to Nashville. We use the best people. Uh, in the studio, the session leaders, the musicians, you know, the engineers. I mean, when people hear our music, uh, that's the thing that they comment about is like, wow, it's up there with, yeah, it has to be up there because they're playing it on the radio yeah. with, uh, with Adele and everybody else, you know. I was right behind Adele. What was she? was number one. I was number two. Yeah, six weeks. For six weeks. Okay. Well, you know, she's got great quality. She's got a great production. So do we. <laughs> and, you know, I tell people, if you're going to be an independent artist, we're independent artists. Um, you've got to go where the where the majors go and, mm-hmm. and you've got to do what they do. Um, when the thing when we were uh, recording our first CD in Nashville, uh, one of the publishers took us aside and he says, you know what? He says, you know, you have really good songs. And they're unique. And I, I think uh, you have a chance if you do it yourself. Because Nashville is not looking for unique and different. And you're unique and different. They're not looking for that. They're looking for what is right now. What's happening right now. But if you do it yourself, and you come out as your different, unique uh, artist, you might have a chance. And he yep. was right. Because yep. from that advice... We went as an independent artist and we hit the charts, you know. Um, it takes a lot of people. It's like being a director in a movie. It takes a lot of people to make that movie work. Well, it takes a lot of people from the time I write the song and, and, and Pepper and I sit in our studio and we work out the arrangements and the motifs, the little motifs that are in the song. And then when we take it to National, sit down with the session leader and he writes out the uh, chart, national chart. And he asks us, how much of this do you want to keep in the song? I said, well, I want this hook and I want that hook. And let's leave it open for the musicians to do what they do. All these people have to come together and make it work. You know, so I encourage people, go to a good studio, get a good session leader, get a good producer, get a good producer. It's hard to do. I'm very fortunate. I have Pepper J. She's an excellent producer. She hears things other people don't hear. We were playing, uh, she was, uh, we were doing a playback and she goes, what's that sound I hear? And everybody looks like, what sound? So I hear something that's off. And everybody listens and says, no, everything's fine. Said, no, she said, isolate everything. So we started isolating, isolating, isolating. And there was one string line in one of the string parts that was out of tune. Oh, wow. Nobody, nobody could hear that, but she could hear that. I mean, that's, a, you know, having that kind of ear, but also that kind of feeling of it needs this or it needs that, you know. You know, we both work on the arrangements, but you have to get a, a producer that, that can go in the studio with you and get you what is organic to you, not what mm-hmm. they like and make it their style of music. They have to make it your style of music and get the results that are best for you. That's what a producer does. Looking at your entire music career, is there anything, this is kind of a fun question. Is there anything you haven't done that you would like to do? Is there a, something, a performance, a style, genre, talking about a certain topic in a song something that you haven't done that you're maybe excited to possibly do well what i i think i I would like to say i'd like to do what i do now um is is work with other people 
Mm -hmm. I think that is the best. When you're on stage and you're working with a group of people, there is a camaraderie there. There's a certain magic there. Um, when I work with Sophie and we're singing harmony songs and, and you know, we're performing, there's a, just a certain harmony. We come together. We're two individual people. In everyday life, we have our own interests. We have our own things. But when we're doing music, we're together. We're, we're mm -hmm. as one. It's like you know, everybody in the band, they all come together for the, that one thing, and, and that's to create something magical. And, you know, I, I, I wrote a song called Like a Rock and Roll Band. It's let's come together. Or let's come together. Peace and harmony. Let's come together in peace and harmony like a rock and roll band. And music brings people together all, from all over the world. You can, uh, and you can see it. You know, people in China and 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 communist countries playing Beatles songs. You know, music just brings people together. You know, and I think that's the best thing. Uh, I'm not trying to create or invent anything new. All I want to do is keep doing what I'm doing, and that's music, and have the opportunity to sing and perform with other people and create whatever we can create. Because you never know, different people, you create different things, magical yeah. things like, oh my gosh, where'd that come from? You know, you, you sit down and you write songs with somebody and go, oh my gosh, uh, you know, I never would have came up with that idea. And, you know, I just wrote a song with a friend, uh, uh, Ray uh, Ligon in Nashville, and met him at one of the singer rounds. And uh, I wrote a song and I, I couldn't think of how to finish it. And, Gave it to him and he finished it and we had a song. Like, oh my gosh, that was fun to do. So it's good to work with people. Just keep doing what you're doing and don't worry about trying to create something so different, so new, you know, just, uh, just do it. <laughs> the final question I'll ask you, for someone that's listening to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals and rise to the challenge? Well, obstacles are terrific. I mean, they're the ones, obstacles are what weed people out. Yeah. You know, uh, when you're in the military, they, they give they make it as hard as they can for you. Mm -hmm. And not everybody makes it. You know, when you go to a jump school, airborne jump school, they, they try everything they can to get you to quit, get out. And those who are left were the ones who will succeed and, and, and do well. Because obstacles train you, they teach you things that you can use in everyday life. Without obstacles, you don't have anything. You don't have uh, uh, perseverance. You don't have the self-respect. Uh, you know, it, it gives you that. You know, so it's nice to have obstacles. Because you know, obstacles are not a sign that says stop. It says think of another way to try to do this. Mm -hmm. you know, every time you come up with an obstacle, that's what it's saying. John, think of a different way and make it work. Don't, you know, it's not, don't give up. You know, don't stop. So that's my advice. And like earlier, find yourself a mentor. If you can find a mentor and, um, and don't give up. That, you know, that's the biggest thing is, you know, don't give up too soon and find a way to make it work. You, you get rewarded by the, the bigger the obstacle and the bigger disappointment that you have in life and how well you handle that, you're rewarded. If you yep. don't handle it well, then you're not rewarded well. If you handle it well, you're rewarded well. Somewhere down the line, but what, the way you handle that obstacle, that uh, let down, that disappointment in your life, and you didn't bring it on anybody else, you just took it, and you say, okay, you know, that's all right. I'm going to keep going. Um, you'll get rewarded for the way you, you, you handle that. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. You're inspiring so many people and we're excited to see what the future looks like for you. Well, keep following us. You know, we're doing, uh, going back to Nashville in November, record new songs. Um, you know, they can hear all the songs on uh, Spotify or, you know, Reverb Nation. Because, you know, once in a while I put up uh, the songs before we went to Nashville. So you kind of get, oh, this is what it sounded like before uh, it hit Nashville. There's similarities, like, oh, yeah, it's the same song, you know, but you can see the quality jump. Uh, and uh, so you can go to johnmichaelferrari.com and 
there's all kinds of things there and um you know but uh, anybody have any questions you know contact us pepper j and i and and we'll answer any questions we can help at all we always try to help people you know in any way we can because uh, we just feel that it's, it's good to do that you know